The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, an award-winning podcast where we reach into the core of the .NET technology stack and, with the help of the .NET community, present you with the information that you need in order to grok the many moving parts of one of the biggest cross-platform multi-application frameworks on the planet. I am your host, Jamie Gaprockman taylor In this episode, I talked with Mike James about Avalonia and XPF. Mike is the CEO of Avalonia, and I wanted to talk about some of the things that Avalonia and its XPF offering solve. This meant discussing Avalonia's competitors, Uno, Maui, and Native Apps, and talking about Avalonia's lack of good quality documentation, which has been solved since we recorded this interview on March 17th, 2023. Along the way, we talked about open source development and some of the expectations placed on open source developers by both the community and the open source developers themselves. And make sure to stick around to the very end to hear Mike drop some software engineering wisdom when he tells us precisely how the team got a cross-platform UI framework running on all of the Linuxes. The way they did it might actually shock you. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast... And let the show begin. Mike, thank you ever so much for agreeing to be on the show and for coming on to the show. This is it's it's a, it's an immense pleasure to be talking to you, a, a, a person who was previously on the Xamarin team and now is at Avalonia and stuff, which we'll go into yeah. in a minute. It's great to have you with us today. Oh, it's great to be on. Thank you so much for inviting me to to come and waffle on about things that I find interesting. <laughs> well, you know, that's what this show is for. It's, uh, you know, I, I was saying to someone the other day about um, part of my my goal for this uh, show, because this is the fifth year, right? So part of it has been, let's talk about a cool thing that people are making with .NET or a cool thing that you can make with .NET or a cool thing that you can use .NET to help, you know, that you could plug into .NET and help you do stuff. Right. Um, and the other half is, you know, there's people out there who maybe like I, I'm a, I'm a, a server side specialist. So WPF, Xamarin, all of that passed me by. Right. The the last piece yeah. of UI I ever built was uh, WinForms. Right. Oh, wow. So it's all brand new. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, WinForms is definitely not brand new. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess a lot of people have fallen into those camps of kind of client side or web dev when when you've done your web dev is that is that typically on kind of the api and back ends or are you in, in the weeds at front end with no js and all of that nonsense so when, when i do front end stuff it's always under ju- great duress right they yeah. have to drag me kicking and screaming to it just simply because right my own personal opinion and we'll do a proper intro for you in a moment but my own personal opinion is that it's not entirely possible to be a full stack dev because what mm. what does the front end stack mean? It's it's obviously it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But then, are you using vanilla JS? Are you using React, Svelte, Angular, Vue? Or I've probably missed a whole bunch there. That's probably going to really upset some people, right? <laughs> and then on top of that, there are limitations in those frameworks because of how how our devices work, right? Mm. Um, the limitations are getting fewer and fewer over time, but there are still a few limitations there. And then is it is it JavaScript or is it TypeScript? If it's JavaScript, is it ES6, ES2015, ES9850? You know, it, it, there's too many too many variables there. <laughs> well, they, they say that choice has a paralyzing effect. And I find mm. that when I do any web development, I am mostly paralyzed. It is <laughs> it is terribly difficult to get started with. Um, and like coming into it is a, uh, you want to do a file new project. It, I mean, you can spend, uh, well, at least I can, I can spend a day just trying to get something to, you know, web pack and to, to compile and minimize everything. And yeah, it's, I, I struggle with web development. I do it, but I, I do struggle with it. Um, so I can understand why you would pick the, the back end pieces and the APIs. That That's a much more pleasant experience, I think. Yeah, and it's um, because there's 
the, there's a, a fewer choices, I think. Um, mm. Well, from my perspective, there are fewer choices, which from my perspective, again, it means that there's more opinionated ideas of how to do stuff. Right. That those opinionated ideas kind of like a Java backend API will work similarly to a .NET 7, .NET 8, ASP.NET Core web end, uh, backend web API because they're both essentially doing exactly the same thing. And because they have evolved alongside each other, then ideas will have cross-pollinated. Whereas I feel, and again, I may be getting this wrong, but this is my experience, my opinion, uh, a lot of javascript -y stuff is very opinionated, but because they've all come from different directions. <laughs> and mm. Because everyone's coming from different directions, and indeed solving different problems, right? Uh, uh, like comparing Angular to React is a non-starter, because Angular is an entire framework, whereas React is like a pluggable architecture that you can bring in to help you with state management and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Angular is very, you will do it this way, and you can't deviate. And you know, React feels a little bit more, eh, you want to bring bring this in, that's fine. Or you want to bring in something else, totally fine too. And neither of those is necessarily wrong or right, right? Because they're just two wonderful different ways of doing stuff that I wasn't there from the beginning, and so I don't really get like how it all fits together. It's, I mean, it's horses for courses, isn't it? And I think that's true for for basically every technology. You know, we're going to talk today about Avalonia, and I'll obviously talk about my history with uh, Xamarin and how I got into uh, kind of native client-side development. But there isn't a right or wrong answer, and people will often come and say, you know, well, which technology should I use? And it's like, well, I, there is no one answer to that. I can give you my opinion, mm. and that opinion is based on my lived experience of using the tech and my needs but your needs might be totally different to, to what I'm looking for. And so I can help you come to your opinion, but I can't just prescribe something to you. Like you should build every single app with Avalonia. Like that's, I'd love to be able to say that, to be honest, but it's, it's, it's not a genuine uh, res or useful response to, to such a question. Sure, sure. And, and you're absolutely right, because then, what you then uh, find is it would be great for you, great for the team and everything, but then you don't you don't you then have a number of native client developers who only have experience with Avalonia, right? And they're mm -hmm. only solving the problems that Avalonia can solve. They're not solving problems that other frameworks or the libraries or the entire systems can can solve. Then, right? Yep. There's, as I say, there's pros and cons to everything, and it's just about weighing them up. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I wonder, uh, Mike, would you be able to give us a bit of an intro to yourself then? You know, because we've been talking for like six minutes now. And we have, we've, we've really digressed. <laughs> yeah, straight out of the gate, we've digressed. And I, so, and I do this because, you know, just an, an interesting conversation. Uh, certainly more interesting than hearing about me. But um, so I, I'm Mike. Um, I, I started cross-platform development, like my first job out of university, I was building apps with Qt, so or Qt. I'm never quite sure how to say it. I've heard some people say it's Qt, but it does feel a bit strange to to say I I, I built with Qt. Um, I'm a Qt developer. Exactly that. <laughs> I'm a Qt. Well, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was C plus plus, and that was like back in the day of Qt four. So it was Qt widgets, and then they kind of changed everything with QML, and it was more. More like XAML, to be honest, but I missed that phrase or phase. Um, so cross-platform like goes all the way back to the beginning of my career. And my second job was at Xamarin, and I worked there all the way through the acquisition. So that was, again, cross-platform, but this time with C Sharp, which was, I'd been, I started to program when I was 13 in VB.net. Please don't judge me for that. You know, we've all made terrible life choices at some point. Um, I have repented and I, I now use C Sharp. I tried S Sharp, but I'm not clever enough. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I started building apps with Xamarin and I, I worked for them. And the, the mission there was how can we help C Sharp and .NET developers build applications for non-traditional Microsoft platforms? We want you to be able to take your existing code and your existing skill sets 
and target iOS and Android. And later on, Mono Mac became commercialized with Xamarin Mac. And even even further on from that, we were acquired by Microsoft and we kind of overnight went from a company that I thought was huge at like four or 500 people to 100,000 and everything <laughs> changed. Like we, we stopped using Google. Uh, so we had like Gmail and Dropbox, uh, most startups do. And we became an Outlook shop using Office 365. And again, there's pros and cons with every technology mm-hmm. choice. Um, yeah, so I worked at Microsoft for seven years. And I recently joined Avalonia. Um, so if I'm sure many of your listeners know what Xamarin is. Some of them possibly don't. Or they've definitely heard of Microsoft, but they might not know what Avalonia is. Um, so Avalonia is a open source cross-platform UI toolkit. And it is, it's a decade old. It's got contributors from all over the planet. Um, I, I was having a look. If, if we look on GitHub, it says like there's 200 and something contributors, but we've got some other analytics that goes goes back even further through the history because the project was renamed. And um, it's actually showing over a thousand contributors, which is crazy, crazy to me. Um, mm-hmm. But it's this, this big project that's uh, part of the .NET Foundation. Most months, it's the most active and uh, popular community project within the .NET Foundation. And it enables people to build cross-platform apps for non-traditional platforms using .NET. So uh, Mac and Linux have kind of been the bread and butter. Obviously, you can build for Windows, but that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. And <laughs> Uh, we, we're we're bringing out soon, hopefully by the time this airs, um, we'll have V11 shipped, and that's enabling iOS, Android, and WebAssembly. So the idea is bring your XAML skills, bring your C Sharp skills. Uh, if you've ever built an app with WPF, you are now an expert in Avalonia. You've not had to do anything; you just are, uh, and you can target these new platforms. And I joined Avalonia as the, the CEO uh, just a couple of weeks ago now, but I've been engaged with the project for years and years. Um, and yeah, we, we're, we're trying to build a commercial side in order to help us support the, the people that have been you know, grinding for a decade for free on the open source side. So we want to commercialize uh, value adds to help us support the open source side. Sure, sure. Because yeah, like I I was having a, a conversation with my friend Scott a few days ago about like um, the the different I want to say expectations that open source developers have um, some some and all of these are perfectly valid what I'm about you know all of these are perfectly valid um, there's some folks who are like I want to make a thing to make the world better and I'll give it away for free and that's awesome brilliant. And then at the other end of a, a spectrum of, of like open source goals, there are, I'll make the thing, I'll give it away for free, and then I'll like question marks profit, right? And then um, right. There's, there's a number of different people in that, in that end who are very, from my perspective of looking at like how people have interacted on Twitter and Reddit and GitHub and stuff, there's, there's multiple different, within that one statement, there's multiple different like spectrum points or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, I have experience of dealing with people who are like, it's open source, but you should pay. Otherwise, grrr, you know, and there's other people who are like, it's open source and there's a paid version. If you want, I, I don't mind I'm doing it in my own time. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And, and I feel like there is a conversation to be had perhaps outside of this one on like setting those expectations for both the open source developers and the consumers of those open source projects. Because I've felt for a while that, like, um, you know, there's that XKCD comic, and I, I keep stepping over you here, Mike. I do apologize, but no, 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 there's no, that please. XKCD comic of, um, you know, here's all the internet infrastructure, and there's this one block that's maintained by a person in a basement in Finland. Yeah, right? we should be supporting those people, right? Because everything we do, we are literally standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Totally, and I think that this is actually a really interesting topic, and. 
I'll, I'll, I'll be frank with you. There are some days when I'm interacting with the community where I just have to turn off notifications and I say, okay, I've had enough with the community today. Uh, sometimes I deal with the community and I'm overwhelmed by the support and the gratitude and I, you know, I'm sharing messages with the team and I'm like, look at the awesome work you're doing. But there are, yeah, the, I th there are others that um, they expect an awful lot and I get it. They're building, they're, they're, oftentimes they're betting their business um, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's a pet project, but they're investing in our technology by using it. And so we have uh, some obligations to them to deliver something that works. But the, the thing is, Avalonia, is, as I said, it's been developed for a decade. And the guys that started it and are still with us all the way through, they've worked really hard to get it to where it is. I mean, this is used by GitHub, Schneider Electric, JetBrains, um, Microsoft, you know, there are there are people using it that, you know, have deep pockets and they could invest in using almost any other technology, but they've picked to use Avalonia. And I'll be honest, with the, the enterprise side of things, that, that we're definitely supported there and we get, you know, we have our support contracts, so we've got agreements in place and they'll sponsor the project as well. So we're we're able to give back to the people that have helped build Avalonia. And our our goal is to to be able to basically employ everyone that's contributing <laughs> we you know that would be our ultimate but we don't want to take anything away and um, there have been other very useful .NET libraries that have changed their licenses um i, I won't name them specifically but you know, there was controversy around it um, and actually, I think that the request that was made was, was super reasonable. If your business is making over a million dollars in revenue a year, pay us a couple of hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, yeah, the, the work that that developer and that team have done is years worth of work. And it's really, you're not going to be able to rebuild that unless you've got a deep knowledge of a very specific niche and I look at that license fee and I think that's a bargain. I would gladly pay that. Number one, to support the dev. Number two, because if I need that, then it's really good value. When we were looking at how to monetize Avalonia, we were, we've always been really clear, like the, the leadership, that it remains open source. We're not changing the license. It's MIT and it will remain MIT. We want to generate revenue to support the project by creating value adds. Now, the first one of those is XPF, which uh, it, it targets a totally different community. So we've got our Avalonia community that are building apps using Avalonia, but there's also a WPF community and, you know, there's a WinForms community and a, a, a kind of micro community in WinUI. Um, <laughs> we were looking at, well, how can we help and target some of the communities outside of Avalonia based on the, the decade of hard work to, to help raise revenue so that we can employ more people, um, employ people that have, you know, as I say, they've worked tirelessly for a decade. And we get we get questions kind of every week. When's, when's V11 going to move from preview? And I, I, I think it might come from... Uh, it might come from a position that they assume that we've got like hundreds of developers and that we've got a big management structure where we've set a deadline and we're going to, we're going to do everything we can to hit that. And we, we're going to ship something when it's, when we've got our, you know, big conference, uh, you know, be it like the, we're going to, we're going to release by .NET Conf. No. We, and I, I'm really keen with the guys when we talk about this is it's ready when it's ready, you know, I don't want anyone burning out. I don't want to tell the guys, you know, you need to you need to pull some all nighters and work weekends. That's not healthy. You know, we'll we'll ship it when it's ready. And if you need to wait another month, I'm genuinely sorry. But you know, the current version 0.10, that's stable. That's in production. That's workable. You you can use that. And we've got people building with the preview versions and. You know, Unity have, have pushed an app to production with it. So if Unity are happy to use it, then you're probably all right yourself. <laughs> but, 
yeah, the, there's. I think there's open source is difficult. I think interacting with any community can be difficult. But we are our community. We were built for it as a community project. The company came into existence only three years ago because of the huge demand from companies. So we're very cognizant that the community comes first in everything that we do. And some days the community is harder to deal with than others, but we still run every decision that we make and all of our future plans are through the lens of what's best for the community. Sure. See, I, I, I like that because it, it feels not that Avalonia ever was, but it feels less like it's, hey guys, should we go in this direction today? No, should we go in that direction? It's, it's less, it's less like decisions on a daily basis. It's more where we have a roadmap, perhaps. I haven't asked you that yet, but let's say we have a roadmap. We're going to go in this direction and, you know, we'll, like you said, we'll ship when it's ready. We'll get there when we get there, right? So stop asking, are we there yet? Because if, if we were there yet, we wouldn't be sitting in the car, would we? Sorry, that's, uh, that's, that's some flashbacks from when I've had to deal with the kids. I do apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I used to be one of those kids. Um, just <laughs> constantly, are we there yet? I want, and I'm really impatient with stuff. And, you know, <laughs> if I had unlimited resources, we would have shipped by now. But uh, as I say, we don't want to ship something that isn't finished. And it's not just code. Like, we, there, the code is obviously a huge part of it. V11 has got a new compositional renderer, which is much closer to how... Uh, UWP and WinUI handles rendering. So it's a huge improvement over the the approach that was closer to that of WPF. So our previous renderer, nowhere near as good or as performant as the new renderer. So that's a big change. We've changed how the styling system works. So that's another huge change. Um, we're currently in the, the process of rewriting how the dispatcher works because as we've been developing XPF, we've realized that actually there are the reason the WPF dispatcher works in the way it does is genuinely useful. So we need to implement some of that gained knowledge into Avalonia UI in order to enable XPF. So like there's the code element, which is a huge undertaking. But then there's also all the auxiliary bits to it. So documentation, samples, making sure that we have all of that because if it's not documented it doesn't exist and um, uh, one of the the key things for us this year and um, we talk about the roadmap is i want us to have the best documentation for building cross-platform ui apps with .NET. Uh, one of the things that i remember when i worked at xamarin was people used to say to me you have the best documentation and i never really appreciated it but even Objective-C uh, and later on Swift developers would come and use the Xamarin docs to understand how to build their iOS apps. And yeah, the penny never dropped at the time of just how good the, the docs were. Um, I hear the opposite most of the time now when I'm speaking to people about Avalonia, and that's because it's a community project. It's been built over 10 years and people will put in incredible PRs with no docs. And the, the team look at it and they go, do we reject this incredible contribution because it's got no docs? Mm, shall we write the docs? Yes. Let's create an issue and we'll get around to it. And then another PR comes in and it's, this, you know, if I had finite resources, we would solve that. So, yeah, we, we hear a lot that the, the docs need improving, and that, that's something I'm really cognizant of. And we're investing a lot a lot in, in trying to solve that for V11. Um, but, you know, the, we've got a technical writer that's working on it at full speed. But again, it's done when it's done. I'm not going to release docs that's half finished because it's it's no use to anyone. So bear with us. And this is all on the community side as well. You know, this is, we're, we're sponsoring this work from the revenue, the modest revenue that's generated from the business. Um, 
but I'd rather be spending that revenue on employing the people that are contributing to the project so that they can work on it full time rather than having to pay a technical writer a lot of money to come in and rework our entire docs because the community are quite happy to complain about it, but then they're not happy to contribute to, to fixing it. And sure. I will I will finish on this one moan about this because this is <laughs> it's still quite raw for me. It was on Reddit, so you know a place where you can have uh, challenging discussions with people. And somebody described our docs as being absolutely horrible. And I, I kind of shot to the heart. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, I know our docs need improving, and we are improving them. Um, and somebody said that it was it was useful feedback, and it's like, but it isn't. To tell me that our documentation is absolutely horrible. I can't action anything with that. Like you said that you struggled with something. Tell me what it, what did you struggle with? Where did you hit a dead end and need to go and dig into source code? Or where were you like digging through our old GitHub issues or through the Telegram chat? Tell me where you, you struggled, create an issue for it, and we will get the docs written. But if we don't know what we're missing, there, or where you're struggling, it's really difficult. So saying that the the docs are absolutely horrible, it, it upset me a little bit. But yeah, it's good. I I feel like I'm just on a tangent at this point. <laughs> no, I, I totally get it. Um, as the great Jermaine Clements of Flight of the Concords says uh, in, I think it's the Hippopotamus versus the Rhinoceros, be more constructive with your feedback, please. Mm. <laughs> Very because, much. Yeah. Yeah, because like this sucks and I hate it. Uh, I, I'm using my own words here. I'm not saying this is what the Reddit user said, but this sucks and I hate it. Well, okay, how do I make it not suck? How do I make it so that you don't hate it? Yeah, right? it it all and comes I, down to compassion, right? <laughs> and I'm I'm totally up for jumping on calls with people and having taking on genuine feedback because I want mm -hmm. us, as I say, I want us to have the best docs. I want us to have the best UI framework. I think, I think we're probably there with the best UI framework, but a lot of people don't know about us. And when they get started, they hit a roadblock. They don't know where to get help. And so they typically, they push through it and they resolve it. But I'm sure that there are some people that we're losing in that process. And I want to fix that. I want to make it the most delightful developer experience imaginable for a .NET developer. Um, but yeah, we need the feedback in order to do that. So telling me it sucks zero points in terms of helpfulness opening a github issue to tell me where you got stuck that's like a, a solid six out of ten and on helpfulness uh sending in a pr with you know the actual this is where i got stuck and this is how you, how i fixed it it doesn't need to be perfect we'll we'll make it fit the style we'll rewrite it so that it's you know perfect we'll fix the grammatical errors we'll but you know contribute something get involved with the project thousands of other people have been doing it um it's you know it's a community project yeah yeah from my own my own experience of providing sort of when i get stuck and then i solve a problem the immediate thing that i do is i open up a notepad or I, it's, it's obsidian these days but whatever mm. whatever technology you're going to use to store your plain text notes open up a note and then just start writing bullet points click this button Type this command. It it, do, it doesn't have to be because like it it can just be. I mean, obviously, submit it to the community, if, you know, because it will help. But it can just be click this button, click that button, type this command in. I don't know what this is, but do this right mm. because then at the very least you then have the steps to get to the you know to to pass on to someone else. And if you want to submit it to the community, then I'm sure you know I don't want to speak for you here, Mike, but I'm sure that there'll be there will be someone on the team who, like you said, can take that and go, right, I've got it. I can make that into a page. I can make that. I can I can, I can. can get the screenshots for you. You don't have to. Just tell me vaguely what you did. Right? Yeah, we, we've got a guy actually that works for us, and he, he basically lives in our community chat. And when people ask questions, that he'll go off and he'll create a sample to, to answer that specific question. And then he'll come back like an hour or two later with the sample on GitHub and he'll share the link. And then it's in our sample repo. And I mean, that's super, super helpful. And I love that, but you know, the people have to know to come in and ask the question. And 
if we don't know where people are getting stuck, it becomes very difficult to, to know how to help. Um, and I think it's probably easier for, so we don't, we don't have any telemetry in like our tooling. And this was something that Microsoft is quite big on. Um, Microsoft uh, fully aware of what issues you're hitting and when you're hitting them and how often you're creating different types of projects and how often you're working on, you know, there's monthly numbers on how many active WPF developers there are and uh, for any technology. And if you look at Visual Studio Code, think about all the telemetry that's collected in there, they can tell you how many Flutter developers there are on any given week. Telemetry is, is kind of, data is king, isn't it, in terms of understanding usage. We're an open source project. We don't collect any of that. And we've considered it. So we've got our Visual Studio extension. And there's a guy from JetBrains that builds the Rider extension. And we've considered, well, should we put telemetry in there so that we can capture, number one, usage, and, and also where people are getting stuck? And every single time we come back to, probably not. Like, it, it, we would love to have that data, but do we really need it? Like, are, I don't, I, personally for me, I don't feel that, I don't feel thrilled when I'm giving up that kind of data. So we err on the side of, mm, let's let's do without. But there is an, there's definitely an argument there for, uh, you know, if, if there isn't, you know, if in a couple of years' time we're in the same position where we still don't know what people are doing, we may need to investigate adding some form of telemetry. But it's it's not something I want to do. So send in your your issues, your pull requests, communicate with us, jump into our chat and tell us where you're having issues. And yeah, just talk to us. It's the most helpful thing. Sure, sure. I also totally get the um, your opinions and feelings on telemetry, right? I feel like with a number of projects now these can be programming projects these could be um frameworks these can be uh, ides and tools it can be it could even be websites right um i know people who will leap directly to the most complicated possible way to do it with the most amount of logging and, and telemetry and, and analytics and all that kind of stuff and then they're like we've got no users i'm like well, no, of course you don't, because you've just spent six years building telemetry and logging and analytics and uh, and the most complex thing ever. Whereas, you know, I, I threw together a HTML page today that has a sign-up form and I've got 15 people signing up, right? That's 15 people who are genuinely... These are all examples, right? But it, it's it, there's a there's a difference between jumping right towards that um, that telemetry and all that kind of stuff, or going the grass. I suppose grassroots. I don't know if that's the right term to use, but the grassroots way of saying come to you tell me because yeah. I can't see, right? I can't because it's there's also um, like in in one of the niches that I exist in in podcasting um, last year and the year before. There was a version of Audacity that got released with loads of logging, and, yes. and and people just got really upset. And we're not going to use Audacity anymore, right? And you mentioned VS Code. Um, there is a project called Codium, which is VS Code without all of the telemetry, but it also means you don't have some of the debugging features as well, because some things are closed source within VS Code. And like, it, it I have this feeling that if you be, you know, if you become big like Avalonia like Xamarin and all these kinds of teams, you release something massive that's that's doing really well, then then you add telemetry, you're gonna get a you might get a core portion of your, your audience, your users, go, I'm not touching that anymore because I don't know what it's doing on my computer. For real legitimate concerns. Right? Absolutely. Um, and and that's yeah. that's precisely there you've described why we we don't we don't want to add telemetry and why when, whenever it's been discussed and it's been discussed, you know, very briefly of like, well maybe we should and it's like, no, we're not doing that. Um, and yeah, it, as, as you quite rightly point out, there are people that that don't want that data to be shared quite rightly um, because it's whilst it helps the project um, the, yeah you don't know precisely what's being shared and there's just a and with GDPR as well how we handle that data it's it's a mm. quagmire that you know our core competencies are building cross-platform UI frameworks for .NET developers I do not want to be getting kind of 
waist deep or even neck deep into you know compliance for for storing usage data and all of that nonsense if you're enjoying this show would you mind sharing it with a friend or colleague check out podcatcher for a link to the show notes which has an embedded player within it and a transcription and all that stuff and share that link with them i'd really appreciate it if you could indeed share the show but if you'd like a few other ways to support it, you could uh, leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. So if you head over to .net core.show slash review, you'll find loads of ways to do that. You could consider buying the show a coffee. The buy me a coffee link is available on each show's show notes page on the website. This is a one-off financial support option. You could become a patron. This is a monthly subscription-based financial support option. And the link to that is included on each episode show notes page as well. I'd love it if you could share the show with a friend or colleague or leave a rating or review. The other options are completely up to you and are not required at all to continue enjoying the show. Anyway, let's get back to it. No, I totally get that. And with that said, let's pivot back to um, uh, cross-platform UIs for .NET stuff. Yes, because right? we, uh, we digress constantly. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's fine. Uh, I, 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 that's why I like having these conversations. It's open-ended. There isn't really a list of questions because we can go anywhere and it's a safe space for people to share, you know, their thoughts and opinions on what, you know, what's happening with different tools and, and all that kind of stuff. So you mentioned earlier on that one of the one of the things that that you're hoping to have released by the time that this episode drops for uh context uh folks we're recording this on the 17th of march and i'm planning to release it on june 9th so there's a bit of time so everything that mike has already said and will say has the caveat of we're talking in the past to you in the future right anything can change between when we're recording and when you're listening so, you know, anything can and will change. And I'm not going to hold you to anything, Mike. If you want to say that the sky is green, I'm like, cool, that's that's cool with me. The sky is green. Let's go with this. <laughs> well, well, hopefully I, I won't say anything that's totally wrong. Um, <laughs> and I, I like to, to uh, un, under-promise and over-deliver. I think that tends mm. to be the, the best strategy. Um, but yeah, in terms of cross-platform UI... Um, yeah, you should say hopefully by the time this goes out, V11 will will hit stable. We've got Preview 6 coming, uh, as you say, we're on uh, 17th. We were thinking it would be this week. It's probably going to be over the weekend. Um, we think we've locked down Master and we're just running tests at the moment. Preview 6 has got some uh, changes to the dispatcher. We weren't expecting a preview six, to be perfectly frank with you. We thought we'd do preview five, we'd do a release candidate, and then we'd be, you know, happy days, it's done. Um, but we we thought you know, there's a couple of things that we want to put in here and, and make some breaking changes. And this is really important because API stability is like, it's something we we prioritize massively. So with each major version of Avalonia, we don't, we, we want to use that major version as an opportunity to make breaking changes. And then once you're into your point releases, then we're not going to make anything radically different. So if we don't kind of do the tidying up that we want to do with V11, then we're going to have to wait like two years until V12. So as we find things that we're like, okay, this probably needs to go in. It's like, okay, let, well, let's create another preview. And who knows, maybe by June 9th, we've got like preview 30 or something and I'll, I'll have gone totally gray, but uh, it's, as I said before, it's done when it's done. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, um, you also mentioned earlier on XPF. Now mm. I think I, I think thinking back on what we've talked about so far, um, I know from my experience, I got to win forms and then went ahead, went away and did some server side stuff. Yep. And then I've come back. It's now the future or it's now the past for the people listening. But <laughs> right now, whilst we're recording, it's the present. Anyway, um, some things happened and a whole bunch of UI technologies happened. Yes. Um, and WPF is one of them. And I know that from my own Googling around, I can make a WPF app. I can have it run on Windows. Fantastic, lovely, not a problem. And I know that when we first started chatting, 
XPF was like a, a thing that had just been announced. Mm. And I'm like, oh, what's this? Oh, wait, what? You can take an XPF app and throw it onto a Mac OS device or onto a Linuxy device. Yes. But not, not everything or every, like, what, <laughs> could you, could you speak to how, because like I'm, I'm speaking again, I'm speaking over you again, but also um, for people who've just heard that and gone, holy moly, guacamole, I need to go and get XPF because Jamie said, right, could you set their expectations? Because I've obviously just blown a hole in everything. No, no, <laughs> what, what, what you said is basically right. It's, uh, it's magic. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got some very, very clever guys that work on Avalonia UI. Um, and so we, we well, let, let, let me give some context. So you're quite right. It allows us to take WPF apps and run them on basically on top of Avalonia. How and why did we do this? Because we've got our UI framework. So the the why is that we created this company three years ago in response to the, the demand from enterprises for support and also for projects. And the projects make up two thirds of the revenue for the business. And some of the projects are like multi-year, you know, one of the big projects is a two year process and the billing is extremely large. But we don't want to grow old porting WPF apps to Avalonia. <laughs> like it is, it is something we will do, and we are more than happy to do it. If you have a WPF app and you want it ported to Avalonia, get in touch. We'll we'll give you a quote. We just don't want to do it forever. And part of the problem with that is that if, as I say, it's, it can be a multi-year process. It's expensive to, to basically halt development of your application to migrate it to any new technology. It takes time. And you've got the, the opportunity cost as well. So not just the cost in either outsourcing or having your devs do it. Your competitor is going to be six months, a year, two years further ahead. And all you've done is reinvent the wheel. You're stood in the same place, but you know in a slightly different outfit. <laughs> so... WPF developers, I mean, WPF was released in, what, November 2006. So it's 16 years old. It could buy a lottery ticket. It could get married with permission from its parents, Microsoft, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> at least in the UK. <laughs> um, it's, it's an old technology in the scheme of things. And there are companies that have built applications using WPF. And these are mission-critical applications. They the businesses live and die by these applications existing and they need a modernization strategy and the one that's coming out of redmond is rewrite the app it's like mm, that's high risk it's expensive and it's going to take a long time and depending on which technology you pick to rewrite to it can be really high risk and it's, sometimes it's just not even suitable. Like one of the suggestions, it was at .NET Conf, was modernize your WPF app to Blazor. And it's like, well, that Blazor's for is a web technology. It's not in any way suitable for some of the apps that you know. A lot of the apps that we see, uh, medical devices or you know embedded devices for measuring uh, particles and you know the Putting that as a web app possibly could be done, but is it the right choice? All of your team are XAML developers, and you're saying, okay, now you need to go and learn this Razor syntax and this web tech. And it's just, it's, I don't think it's a viable solution. And given the amount of interest we've had in porting, we didn't think it was a viable solution. So, yeah, we're, we're porting all of these apps, loads of customers, more demand for porting than we can realistically service and we don't want to grow old porting WPF apps so we, we were looking at well how can we fix this and Avalonia UI is like the spiritual successor to WPF it's, it's really similar but there are some differences we haven't just blindly copied the WPF APIs um, we, be, because then we <laughs> you would end up with all of the limitations and not every decision that the, the Avalon team made back in the day kind of passed the mustard. Is it passed the mustard? I think that's the correct phrase. 
Let's say it's the correct thing, yeah, right? It, You've said it twice, I'll say it, pass the muffled, there we go. It's. Yeah, if it's <laughs> not, I would be curious, because to me that sounds right, but I often get these things wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, do, we didn't... The project has never been about blindly copying WPF, but it's similar enough that most companies, if they've got a well-architected MVVM application, we can do a port pretty quickly. We're doing a port at the moment for a big financial institution. Um, they've used MVVM. They've got some nice DI. So it's it's basically just a case of updating SAML files and changing the styles. So it's not it's not difficult, but it's tedious. Depending on how many views you have, it becomes very time-consuming. So we decided let's build a compatibility layer. And when we were discussing how we do this, we were thinking two options. We either do what we've done with XPF, which is fork WPF, or we build some kind of migration tool where you could migrate your app to Avalonia and it would just like convert your APIs. We, we quickly, or I was quickly told why the migration tool was a terrible idea. Um, and, and that's because the third party dependencies, you don't have the source code for if you're using Telerik or Infogistics or ActivePro, you don't necessarily have the source code for that. Um, so just a migration tool isn't going to bring your entire app across. So we decided mm -hmm. let's go with the, the, the forking of WPF and make it run cross platform. So Microsoft made WPF open source. It was very generous of them. Um, but they kind of, I like to describe it, it's a phrase that Nat Friedman from Xamarin used to use, of just throwing something over the fence. It's like you forget about it, you just lob it over and it's done. So they, they open sourced WPF and then kind of forgot about it. They weren't accepting uh, contributions and there were lots of questions about can this be cross-platform and it, it was just to get it to build on a Windows machine was, you know, arduous. Um, so we, we decided, well, thank you very much, Microsoft. We're going to take that and we're going to fork it. And we're going to replace all of the low-level implementation with Avalonia. So we're going to leave the presentation framework and presentation core largely untouched. We've had to make a couple of changes, but it really, we we're making a it's a really big point for the team of don't change the code in, in those libraries. It remains the same. Um, and what we're doing is we're replacing mill core. So the lower levels with Avalonia. Um, and so this means that you can take your WPF app and you can run it on Mac OS and Linux and WebAssembly and iOS and Android will be coming next year. But you can do that by only changing the CS proj. So you, wow. Yeah, you open up the CS proj, you change the project SDK, uh, you need to remove the use WPF because you're not using that anymore. Um, so it's project SDK, use WPF, and you hit F5, and you're now running on XPF. And you can take that those binaries and you can do it on a Mac, you can do it on Linux. Um, we ha Nikita, who is like one of, one of our many resident geniuses or genii, he he's incredibly bright. He um he he develops on Linux, and he saw that Paul Thorot had liked one of our tweets, so he jumped onto Paul Thorot's GitHub, found an application that he'd written, uh, he cloned it to his machine, opened it up in JetBrains Rider, updated the the project SDK. That app had a dependency on WinForms, so he, he had to add a, an additional attribute, which is. Uh, use XPF WinForms shims true. Uh, with that, he hit F5 and he was now running this WPF app. And it was literally like 30 seconds to do that migration. Wow. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so it is magic when it works. But it, it's not a silver bullet. There are, there are times when, and there are things that we can't do. So I mentioned the WinForms shims. We've got Win32 shims as well. And these are really needed for those Telerik and Dev Express controls, where they're oftentimes it's a WinForms control masquerading as WPF. And so we can support that and we do support it. We've got customers that have got 
entire apps that are just full of Telerik and Dev Express and Active Pro and all the various control vendors. Um, and we do that by, uh, at the moment, my guys take the application, they attach the debugger, and they run it on XPF, and they're looking for where where are these controls reaching down into GDI and Win32 APIs, and then we're providing those shims to make them work cross-platform. So that's that's why we've not given out XPF as a demo for everyone to run, because if you just took it and your app in any way was calling into an API that we hadn't created a shim for yet, then it would crash. And that'd be a horrible experience for you. And you go, this doesn't work. And <laughs> in, in your case, it wouldn't work. But if you are using pure WPF, then it is magic and it just works. And if you're not, then our, our guys will make sure that those APIs are available. And we think within six months or a year, touch wood, we will we'll have all of the shims in place required to run like 90, 95% of all applications uh, cross-platform without needing to speak to us. So we're, we're building an analyzer tool that is based on the old mono analyzer. Um, so it's called MoMA. It's a tool that Joseph Hill, one of the co-founders of Xamarin, he created. It was, he describes it as his baby. We've taken that, we forked it, we've updated the definitions to use uh, XPF definitions. So you bring in your WPF app and it can tell you these are the problems that you're going to have. Um, and then from that, if, it, if it's like 100%, like this is great, you've got no worries, you're not using any Win32 APIs, you're not using any WinForms APIs um, that we haven't already provided in our shims, then click here to buy a license and you're off to the races. Um, if if it's a, like oh, we need to do some work on our end, it's a case of get in touch and we'll we'll work with you to make sure that your app works. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I do remember seeing something on Twitter a few weeks back where um, uh, one of the Avalonia engineers. Uh, I think it was this story, but yeah, I may be misremembering. Where one of the Avalonia engineers was like, uh, somebody. I, I believe it. Oh, it was somebody was in uh, interacting with Olia from Microsoft, mm. and Olia had said, "Get in touch, and we can help you migrate stuff." Yeah, we'd already and done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it was like six days later. Oh, yeah. By the way, we've already done this. And then I was like, "This is amazing!" In six days, and someone else pointed out, "No, no, no. It took an hour." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that off off the original Paul Thorot. Let's run his app in 30 seconds on Linux. You know, it was like the speed run super quick. <laughs> a guy in the, the community, Laurent, he, uh, he posted a screenshot of the app that got him interested in WPF. It's like a really early sample from 2006 of, called Family Show. And he said, it would be cool if you could get this to run on XPF. And it's like, challenge accepted. And <laughs> Nikita... He grabbed the code and it was .NET. It was a really early build of uh, of .NET runtime, um, and we can we can do it on mono, but we prefer it to be on .NET six or .NET seven. Like sure. that's like the easy path for us. So he spent like forty four and a half minutes migrating it to .NET seven, <laughs> <laughs> and then he spent thirty seconds getting it to run on XPF. <laughs> so wow. yeah. It, <laughs> And then, and then we posted a video of it, and like people were were loving it quite rightly because it is those kind of demos look great. Um, and it's something. Hopefully, when this goes out, we'll have much more in in terms of marketing uh, to show people it working and what the experience is like. Um, but also, I'm quite enjoying when I chat to people and demo it to them. And I'm in Visual Studio, and I update the SDK and hit F5, and you know, you can kind of see the draw, the the jaws just drop down, and like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, it's got me thinking about like, okay, so I'm going to ask you a personal opinion question. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not going to hold you to what you say here, and I don't think anyone listening should. So. In your opinion, what is the future of .NET cross-platform application development? Is it Avalonia? <laughs> oh, oh, see, that caveat at the end makes it. Uh, I, 
I'm going to be honest, I don't know. I don't know. I'd love for it to be Avalonia. But I think that, okay, there are three, there are three players in this mm-hmm. uh, in terms of cross-platform. If you just want to go for Windows, uh, then you've obviously got WinForms, WPF, UWP, WinUI. Take your choice. If you want cross-platform, you can go with... Well, actually, there's kind of four. You've got Maui. You've got Uno. You've got what was we used to call traditional Xamarin, which is just the the bindings to iOS and Android. I don't think I could, in good faith, recommend those approaches, especially for iOS, given Apple uh, are moving most of their SDKs to Swift. And whilst they do have a Swift binding story, there are many, many APIs that aren't available there now. Um, So I I would kind of discount the traditional uh, Xamarin approach. So yeah, you have Uno, Maui, and Avalonia. I I don't, people often ask me if I think that Uno is a competitor. I don't, simply because I've, I've seen the usage numbers for UWP and WinUI. Um, it's, it's tiny. Um, so I, I don't lose any sleep over what they're doing. And I think that re-implementing, I've been very vocal about this, I think re-implementing a Windows API uh, to Mac, Linux, and web, and all of the platforms, and being bound by what occurs in Redmond doesn't particularly make sense as a strategy. Um, I wish them good luck, but for me, um, it, it's not not something that I worry about. I think Maui, obviously being the continuation of Xamarin Forms, super strong on mobile. So I think right now, if you're building a mobile app, you should probably just cut straight to to, to Maui. Uh, that being able to to use native controls in a mobile app is really important because a lot of the best mobile apps that you'll use are using native UI controls. On desktop, the story is quite different. It's it's really rare to use a native desktop app. I mean, we're chatting here in Discord. This is absolutely a web app masquerading mm-hmm. as a desktop app. Teams, the same thing. Visual Studio Code, Figma, like Slack. I struggle to think of apps that I use on a regular basis that are actually not just a website. So we're competing against those technologies on the desktop. And when you deliver a native app, it's so much more performant. It's using so much less memory. It's quicker to start. There's a whole host of benefits. So... uh, I think that Avalone is really, really strong in the desktop space, and we do really well in embedded. WebAssembly is definitely going to be interesting, but Maui doesn't support WebAssembly. They can't support embedded because they don't support Linux. So I think, as I said right at the beginning, it's horses for courses. There's no right or wrong answer. For me, I've worked at Xamarin. I loved that technology. I think that Maui has a lot of potential. I don't. I think that on the desktop side, to be frank, I think they've made some decisions that are going to haunt them for a very long time. I think that picking WinUI was a terrible decision, and an even worse decision was to pick Mac Catalyst. Even Apple can't make decent Catalyst apps. I don't know how you could possibly create one using an abstraction even higher. Um, so. I, yeah, I think that we, we're in a really unique position because of how we work. Because we use Skia to render everything, we have full control of how your app looks. So it's much more like Flutter. And when we, when we think about competition, on mobile, we're looking at Flutter. That's our competition. We're not worried about what Maui's doing because we think, and I, I've certainly seen this, a lot of companies now, they're going, well, Maui isn't ready and it's, it's quite a sad state of affairs. Um, if we need a mobile app, let's just build it with Flutter. And so the question that we're thinking about as a team is, how do we make it so that they don't go to Flutter and that they come to us instead? So I've, I've got a guy that's working on Android basically full-time to improve our Android story, and we've just hired a guy that's going to be working on the iOS side of things. So mobile is you know, one of our key investments. 
And then on the embedded side, we looked to Qt or Qt because they're, they're the market leaders. Um, so I think that Avalonia is in a really strong position to kind of take over all of .NET. I think because of our heritage as well, being community focused, it's a community project. It wasn't started by some giant corporation or profit-seeking entity. Um, we we were built by the people for the people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's cool. I, I, it, it, yeah, um, I, I do feel like it was a very leading question and a bit tongue-in-cheek of me to ask. You know, I'm just, I'm kind of being silly. Uh, you know, we've we've talked really sort of serious stuff so far. Wanted to throw out a curveball and be a little bit silly, but I like the 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 way that you put that. Um, because yeah, my my experience with Maui is is that it isn't it it doesn't do what I want it to do, and that that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. That doesn't mean that it's not good. It just doesn't seem to be able to do what I want to do. And you know, I'm sitting here talking to you with my M2 Mac Air, but my daily driver is Ubuntu, right? Yeah. And I've been able to run um, a, a .NET Maui Android app wrote a blog post, sent it over to Microsoft and was like, hey, I've gotten it to run, but I can't do debugging, I can't do hot reload, but it'll start. Also, because I'm on Linux, it's in Rider, so deal with that as you must, <laughs> you know, because I just couldn't get it to work in VS Code. But this was like um, September last year, so September 2022. Mm. So obviously things have come along since then, and we're recording this in the past. So things will have changed between now and when people are listening too. So yeah. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is sit on the fence, right? Because uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a moving target, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think your position as a, a podcasting host, you would need to sit on the fence. I don't think I, I need to sit on the fence on this. We, you know, we, with Maui, we are very keen to have a partnership with them because as I said, on the mobile space, if you want to compete with in the consumer and I used to say this at Xamarin as well. If you want to build a consumer application for mobile, you really do need to be using native controls. And I think, to be honest, you probably need to be building it for iOS and Swift. And then on Android, using Java. Or I, I, I'll admit, Android for me is something I basically ignore 99% of my time. Um, but I think that, yeah, to deliver that kind of five-star experience, right now you probably just want to be using Swift. And when Xamarin was created, the only option you had was Objective-C. And that was a horrific language to develop in. So, like, <laughs> C-sharp was a breath, uh, breath of fresh air. It was lovely. But Swift is also really, really nice to use. So I think if you want native controls, then just build it with Swift. I, I wouldn't bother with anything else if you don't need native controls well then there's a whole host of options available to you and um, you might want to look at flutter right now because it's you know it's pulling away from where we are in, in the dot net world and that's why we look to to flutter as to, as the competition and we want to be much closer to, to their functionality but coming back to my point we we wanted to to partner with the maui team and we created a hybrid approach that enables you to embed Avalonia into a Maui app. So you can kind of mix and match. You can have some native controls with uh, Avalonia controls in there as well. And we've also considered creating a backend for Maui based on Avalonia. So just like their backends run on Mac Catalyst and WinUI and a Coca Touch and Android widgets, we could do it that it sits on top of Avalonia, and that would enable your Maui app to run on Linux, and it would enable your Maui app to run on WebAssembly as well. Um, we, to be frank, we don't know if we want to pursue that because you know we're a small team, we have finite resources, and do we do we want to kind of be Working and maintaining that code for uh, a project that's maintained by a multi-billion corporation. I mean, Microsoft's got a market cap of $2 trillion. Um, if, I, th I kind of feel if they, if they really wanted Linux and WebAssembly support based on Avalonia, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to them about sponsorship of that work and we could, <laughs> we could come to some arrangement. But I'm not sure I want to, 
we've got the proof of concept, it works, um, but I'm not sure I want to flesh that out and kind of go to production with it. But sure. we'll see. Okay. Um, so, so we've talked, we've talked to Avalonia, we've talked a little bit about XPF and the magic that it is. And I mentioned at the start that I'm one of these developers where everything in the UI completely passed me by. Mm. So I was wondering, um, just to get your initial thoughts on, cause I know we're running low on time now. Um, your initial thoughts on how the heck do I as someone who completely missed out on WPF, WinUI, UWP, everything after WinForms, how the heck do I go about learning to use Avalonia or any of these new technologies, right? Because, you know, I'm sitting here going, well, like I said, I tried out using um, Maui, but Xamarin passed me by too, right? Yep. So the whole XAML everything just whoosh straight past. So, like, I feel like I'm possibly a, a tough case for you and the team to write docs for? Because, like, do you have to sit there and teach me XAML in order for me to use Avalonia? And then if you are teaching me XAML, then what about the people who have done XAML and WF and all the WPF, sorry, and all of the other technologies? They're then being left in the dust. They're like, well, I can't, I can't, I can't sit here and read through this documentation of hey, this is, you know, this is how we do this. This is, you, know, you need to do your anchor tags and all this kind of stuff. So, like, I can imagine that whilst me as an individual, I am a very, very tiny part of your potential user base, but there'll be you're the most of your user base. You, oh, you, okay. oh, thank you, very you much. as an individual, <laughs> all priority is on. Um, so our technical writer has very limited experience with Avalonia. And you would, you would think, like, that's, it, that's an odd choice. Why would you hire a technical writer that doesn't know your framework? Um, but it's actually proven to be incredibly beneficial because he is asking all of the questions that you would probably ask. He comes from a MVC background, so he knows HTML, he knows some JavaScript, he knows CSS, but he's more about uh, ASP.NET development. So his way of modeling and thinking about application development mirrors much, much closer to yours than it does mine. And so he's asked some absolutely fantastic questions. And the way that he's writing the docs, uh, it does go back to the basics of, you know, what is XAML? And we need that because there are people that need to understand. You don't have to use XAML to write Avalonia. You can use just POCO, so plain old CLR objects. So you write it in C Sharp or VB.NET or S Sharp if that's your thing. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could even do it in Co COBOL because there's a .NET version of that. Uh, it, it doesn't matter as long as it's .NET language. Um, so yeah, you. my advice would be read the docs. If that's how you like to learn, if you don't like to learn reading docs, there's a, a, a plethora of YouTube content available to you that will teach you Avalonia. If you get stuck and you're, and you're wondering, well, or you, you finish watching every Avalonia video on YouTube, start learning about UWP or WPF or just the standard approach, you know, MVVM and, and XAML. I think if you know HTML, you basically know XAML, you know, it's a, it's a markup language. If you know how to write XML, you know, XAML, it's, you know, it's, it's not a terribly difficult thing. It's just about under, it's about building that mental model. And that's what our new docs, which are, my goodness, I, I hope I can say they're already out <laughs> in the future. Now in the past, um, <laughs> we, we have tentatively said that we will publish next week, but I need to, to, double check with the, t the team but yeah they, they are focused on taking you from an absolute beginner with no experience through to to building an app on your preferred platform for your preferred platforms but on top of that we you know we, we've got the the sample so you can clone those whack the breakpoints in explore how it works fiddle with things break it and when you get stuck come to our community chat with them you know you you might ask a question that generates a new sample um, yeah, just, Fantastic. just play. Okay. Um, and then I guess, um, 
if I could collect some links from you outside of our recording, I could put them into the, the show notes for things like links to the community and, and you know, things like that. That would be pretty useful. Yeah, um, I will share everything that we have. Awesome. That's very kind of you. Awesome. Um, what about getting in touch with you then? Are you open to people reaching out on Twitter and saying, hey, Mike, here's this thing, right? Yeah, yeah. My, my and then you maybe direct them to the right person? or Definitely. I don't have the answers to everything. Um, I'm not all-knowing. It's a shame. I wish I was. Um, I, I leave that to my wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my DMs are open on Twitter. Um, you can, if you're more of a LinkedIn person, you can ping me on there. I'm on this new thing that everyone jumped to when Elon bought Twitter. Uh, same handle, mikecodes.net. I, I don't even know if there's DMs on that, but if there are, you can DM me there as well. Um, yeah. Uh, or you can email me at mike at avaloniaui.net. Um, I can't promise I'll get back to you quickly, but I will endeavor to, to get a response to you at some point. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, I feel like I need to try out uh, tele- uh, not Telegram. It wasn't that. It was Mastodon. Mastodon. I feel like I need to try out Mastodon now because like everybody jumped to it. And I was like, I'm fine with all the cool, cool people going. You all figure it out. And then... You can be like the early adopters and figure out all the pain points. And now I can come in afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm super late to the party on it. And I only I only kind of started an account because people were pestering me to be like, well, he's only <laughs> tweeting on Twitter. And it's like, yeah, okay. I, I, and I just copy and paste them. So it's basically the same thing. So you, you don't need to follow me in both places. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, Mike, thank you ever so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm walking away with a better appreciation of not just Avalonia, but of like uh, desktop UI development. Um, and I feel like there's there's a, a conversation to be had, uh, perhaps, if you're interested, or if anyone on the team is interested, about just the magic of getting um, a desktop UI running on a Linux, right? Because just real quick for people who don't know, there isn't one Linux, mm. right? And there isn't one desktop experience on Linux. And there isn't one like graphic, uh, graphics, I'm using the wrong words, but like graphics pipeline for Linux, right? So getting an app to run on any of the Linuxes to me is wizardry is what it is it's a little bit more than magic it's wizardry it is wizardry <laughs> and i i can I, I can actually answer this really quickly the key to that is to pick your dependencies well so we only depend on x11 so we can we can run on just the linux kernel you don't need a desktop environment we can output by the frame uh, frame buffer it's like the lowest level which is why we're perfect for embedded so yeah just if you start to depend on gdk then you're in for a world of pain don't do it just use x11 uh, we have wayland support coming as well but yeah pick your dependencies well and then it becomes pretty pretty easy wow okay wow that's that's a that's a nugget right there um that's some that's some proper software engineering um uh knowledge drop right there pick your dependencies very carefully mm. because i feel like everybody just goes nougat install npm install ruby install or whatever it is right definitely and they just yeah Cool. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I like I said, I've I've come away from this with lots more knowledge, and I am raring to go to learn way more um, Avalonia and way more desktop stuff. Because, like I said, it passed me by completely. So, I really appreciate it. Well, it's a pleasure, and we I look forward to and we look forward to seeing you in the community. Oh, absolutely! I'll be in there later on this afternoon. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you ever so much. That was my interview with Mike James. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Head over to .netcore.show slash review for ways to do that or reach out via our contact page at .netcore.show slash contact. And to come back next time for more .net goodness. See you again real soon. See you later, folks.
Go Nerdcore Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited. 